Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Delighted, as always, to return to the Psychiana lessons. Today, we will go to Lesson 14. And here, as suggested in previous lessons, we get to the point where we can experience God in the moment, according to Frank Robinson. So far, if you followed these lessons, he's given affirmations and exercises along the way, and setting this particular episode up where you can experience God in the moment. Advanced Course Number 1, Lesson 14 Dear friend and student, this lesson is the focal point of everything that has gone before. It is the point at which I show you how to actually and literally find and use the power of the mighty life spirit of the universe. In the other lessons, I have led you slowly, step by step, up the ladder until you have now arrived at a point where you may see the view stretched before you. This lesson will show you how to do that, for it is the most dynamic thing I have ever put into print. What you do with it lies in your own hands. If you use this cosmic power for your own good and the good of others, it will repay you many times. Let me warn you not to use it for the harm of others, for if you do, it will turn like a serpent and sting you. Sincerely, your friend, Frank B. Robinson. In our last study together, we dealt with the character Jesus of Galilee. In this lesson, we shall look a little farther into that man's life and try to discover the secret of his impelling charm and power. For it would be useless to try to tell me there is not a magnetic attraction and charm attached to this man. I know better. And while, of course, he could not have been other than a human being, still the attraction and charm is there just the same. This comes from the spiritual realm where the God law operates. And in passing, may I say to you that it is not possible for a man or woman to know very much about the spiritual realm of God or the God law and not be full of charm and power. There's a very subtle something to the man or woman who has learned the secret of abiding in God or the great God law that I am teaching you about. It is often hard to explain there can be no question of the presence of this subtle something in the human life that knows the spiritual power of the God law. Men may try to explain the impelling and compelling power in such a life, but it cannot be done for the power is spiritual and therefore cannot be explained by natural means. As a matter of fact, however, we have seen that the spiritual realm, which has so often been alluded to as the realm of mystery, is after all nothing but the divinely natural realm and the same spiritual power that exudes from this Christ man should exude from you. More than that, it will exude from you in the moment you know and use spiritual God law as this carpenter man knew and used it. And this is the normal natural condition of every man and woman. If you are living apart from the so-called divine power as manifested by this Christ man, then you are not enjoying life to the full and neither are you yourself. For the natural and normal condition of every man should be that he lead a life of overwhelming victory over the world around him and over everything that crops up in his life which is not wanted. There should exude from the normal man a power that can create whatever it is he needs and more than that such a power is now at the disposal of every man if he will take it. It is not necessary to wait till after death before the power of the unseen or spiritual realm may be known. Can you imagine what sort of a life yours would be if you had and could use the same power that this Christ man used? Would not your life be a much more blessed thing than it is now? I think so. Well, the power is here. It is the God power. It is not the power of any so-called subconscious mind, for such a mind does not exist at all and never has existed. It is just simply the overwhelming power of the mighty life spirit, anxious and waiting for you to use it in your daily life and affairs. Everything I have said to you to date in these lessons has been designed to bring you to the point where you will be able to absorb and understand the truth this 14th lesson teaches. And it is a mighty spiritual truth too. Slowly I unfolded to you the facts of nature and of nature's God as I believe them to exist. I showed you that your thoughts are the real spiritual part of you, 
I tried to show you something of the magnitude and reality of life itself. Then I brought to your attention the fact of the existence of the cosmic rays, and you will have observed that through these lessons to date, I've been slowly and carefully taking you by the hand and leading you along the spiritual life path until such time as I considered that you were capable of absorbing a little bit of the real spiritual truth and more than that of literally applying it in your own life. Had I given to you the truth this lesson contains right on the start, the chances are many to one that you would have said, oh well, that fellow's crazy, I'm not going ahead with this course of instruction. But leading slowly and gently over a period of months, as I have led you, if you are a normal and intelligent thinking person, you should be ready by this time to start to really apply the God law in your own life after you have found it. The first thing to do is find it. I don't think there are many of my students that have come along this far with me without finding a little bit about the existence of this mighty God law. They will not have known it to the very full of course, but I have not yet fully explained just what this law is and just how it operates. I'm giving you a glimpse of what to expect in this lesson now, and under this lesson lies a lot of spiritual truth. I trust you will grasp it all, for if you do, then the world may be yours and everything it contains. At any rate, enough of the world's pleasures may be yours to satisfy you. The religiously inclined, of course, will quote to me the old Bible saw, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. All I have to say to that doctrine is that it is but one more old church teaching, of certainly unknown origin and therefore not credible at all. Never let anyone tell you that any pleasure you may have here on earth is not pleasure obtained from the life spirit. Don't let anyone tell you that you should not try to obtain the blessings of life while you are here, for such is not a fact. The spirit that gave you life in the first place is interested in seeing you enjoy life. More than that, such a spirit is interested in your enjoying life, not in the future, but here and now if you please. What sort of a being would the creative life intelligence be if he would create or implant in you the desire for the very best things of life and then tell you that you never could have them here and now but will get them after you die beyond Jordan that is church myth once more and it is not the truth as far as the moss and rust and thieves go we have some very good safety deposit boxes in our banks and there's not much likelihood of very much moss growing on our money nor do I think with the up-to-date banking contrivances we have, there is much chance for it to get very rusty. I can assure you, mine doesn't. It doesn't stay in one place long enough for that. And those thieves, well, there are burglar-proof vaults in almost any bank, quite sufficient to keep out the average burglar. In any event, if while in the charge of a bank your money gets rusty or covered with moss, or if it is stolen by thieves, the bank will be held responsible and will either clean up and restore your money to you or will replace it with new money. So you see, the Bible argument here is not so good. It will not hold water. At any rate, I shouldn't stop trying to accumulate money if I were you on account of this ancient Bible paragrapher's story about the rust and the moss and the thieves. My advice to you is to use the power of the living spirit for the accumulation of whatever good things you need in this life. This is what the Spirit of God exists for. It would be useless to us otherwise. If the great creative life principle cannot do for you here and now the things you desire, then the chances are neither can it do these things beyond the tomb. And this tomb proposition is all so very vague and indefinite anyhow. There's not enough evidence of any life after death to justify your living in poverty here and now, denying yourself the things you could enjoy on the strength of the hope that you will get them after you are dead. This life after death theory is a very beautiful one to be sure, but it was born in the minds of men who did not know spiritual law. They knew nothing at all of the power of God, or they would not have originated such a theory as that. The theory is as old as the hills anyhow, 
and was in existence thousands of years before the Christian era commenced. It is far older than Christ and was known to millions of Egyptians thousands of years before Christ was ever heard of. In the meantime, thousands of good followers of the Lord have been living in abject poverty because they believed such a story as this one purports to be. They are resting their oars on past age dogma and tradition, all the while passing up the real truths of God, and have also passed up all investigations into the spiritual realm, which investigations might finally disclose the truth that death is not a part of the scheme of life in any sense of the word. In other words, superstitious religionists have left us with the idea that no man can obtain happiness until after he is dead. Such an impossible teaching, such an awful dogma as that is. And it has been given to us in the name of God by men and women who claim they know God. As a matter of fact, I am pretty well convinced in my own mind they know nothing about him at all. And I am convinced of something else too. I am convinced that as long as the asinine theories of supernatural birth immaculate conception, resurrection, are indulged in and taught. Nothing tangible about God can be learned by those teaching and believing such incredible yarns about the mighty Creator. Life is life and is not death in any form. Remember that. I shall not go into what life means in this course of instruction. I deal with that somewhere else and in a more advanced teaching which students of this course are not quite ready for yet. But the question continually comes into every normal man's mind at some time or other in his lifetime. He wants to know where life originated. He wants to know what it is. He wants to know why it ends so suddenly. The religionists have told us that such things were only hidden in the heart of God and were not to be known by mortal men. And in reply to such statements, I say, who said so? That these truths are hidden in the heart of God is quite correct, but not in the heart of any old pagan Yahweh, such as the old Jews owned for a God. Shall I tell you just where these secrets are hidden, my friend? They are hidden in the heart of God, all right, but God is the creative spirit and intelligence through whose power and in whom we live and move and have our being. That is where they are hidden, if you can properly use the word hidden, and I am not so sure they are hidden at that. Those of us who have paid the price and who know something of the law governing the spiritual realm know full well that these things may all be known here and now. We know that it won't be very long until we shall know them here and now. The future story does not appeal to us, for we know its origin, but you may be sure of one thing, my friend. You may be sure of the fact that there is law, spiritual law, and order underlying the entire realm of God, the spiritual realm. The future will disclose the fact that the truths of God are natural truths within our grasp here and now. True it is that we have not yet seen them fully, but that means nothing. There was a time when the radio law was unknown too. There was a time, and not so long ago, when electricity as a lighting agent was absolutely unknown. It is not very long since a certain city petitioned the city council to pass an ordinance denying people the right to install electric light because it is an invention of the devil. And what was right here in the good old United States at that? So there is no argument at all in the statement that because these things have never been fully known, they can never be fully known. And I don't want a single one of my students to ever believe that heathenish story. Who knows, probably one to whom I am writing now will be the one who will venture into the spiritual realm and will disclose to the world some of its hitherto unknown secrets. Who can say? For it may be that you, yes you, will progress so far into this marvelous realm of God that you will be capable of understanding the revelation that this realm can give to you and will transfer to us hungry mortals something more than we know now of the truth of God. For the last thing has not yet been learned about this realm. This realm will not be plumbed to the full account until the secret of death is known. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. And maybe before this comes from our printing presses, some new and marvelous revelation will have been given to man from God. Let me put that another way. Let me say that some man or woman will have been willing to trust the God law to the limit. 
and so will discover whatever he can hold of God. The spiritual law cannot operate to the full as long as death reigns supreme on the earth. It was not meant that it should so reign, and beloved student, hear me well when I say to you that the full understanding of the spiritual law of God will absolutely banish death. Carry that thought with you and live in the spirit that death is not necessary. We know that disease is not necessary and we know that poverty is not necessary either. And you may rest assured that neither is death necessary. It takes one of two kinds of men to make the above statement. Either a man must be a fool or he must have progressed to quite some depth in the realm of God. I wish to assure my students that I am not looked up on nationally as any sort of fool. In making the above statement to you, I know whereof I speak. In a much further advanced course, I go into the realm of the creative power of the life spirit, but as I stated, I shall not pursue that study here in this course, for if you master this course, you will have enough to keep you busy the rest of your life, learning day by day a little more of the marvelously beautiful power of the living life spirit, God. Never get away from the fact there is a definite purpose running through all creation, and death has no place in that divine purpose. Day by day brings us closer to our goal. Day by day see some students of mine doing what might be considered very unusual to say the least. I have in mind how one lady student who before she was halfway through this course of instruction saw the light. And her manifestation of the living God shows to others through the gift of healing. She's able to take cases that no physician can possibly help. And through her knowledge of the spirit of life she's enabled to do for them what is often considered a miracle. But there are no miracles where God is concerned, nor were there any miracles in spiritual law. What seems miraculous to human and material eyes assumed a perfect naturalness when the light of the creative life spirit is thrown upon it. It is literally amazing the things that human life can accomplish when their union and harmony with the God law is fully or even partially recognized. I'm often asked, well, Dr. Robinson, do you mean to tell me that your teaching can do this or can cure that or can rectify the other thing? And my reply invariably is that if there is any limit to the power of the living spirit God, then I have never yet been able to find it. I'm not looking for it either because I know that such limit does not exist. The limitation is not on the part of the God law, but is on your part and my part. For would we throw all doubt and fear to the four winds absolutely and completely there is nothing the human mind can conceive that the god of this universe would not do every inch of ground that the sole of your foot shall tread upon shall be yours every bit of confidence you can put in the god law will bring forth much fruit and if it is material blessings you are looking for it will bring them too don't forget that I shall not deal with the subject here as to whether or not Galilean carpenter ever worked miracles. I deal with that elsewhere and shall not touch upon the subject here any more than to say that if he did, he did it through a complete knowledge of the spiritual God law at his command. Take the allegory of the Lazarus story. You will remember that when word was brought to the master that Lazarus was dead, the first thing he did was to get away for a while. One would have thought that he would have gone immediately, but he did not. And I think perhaps I know the reason why he did not go. Anyway, he abode where he was. Finally he went, however, and the statement he made in the form of a preacher is very, very significant. Lifting his eyes to the heaven, he said in effect, Father, I don't need to pray for myself because I know that you can raise this dead man. So don't take this prayer as an evidence of my doubt. But I am merely praying this prayer in order that the throngs that are with me might not make the mistake of attributing any miraculous power to me. They might know that you, great life spirit, are the one who will do this healing. And then as the story runs, he called with a loud voice and the dead came to life again. In the first place, Jesus Christ realized first and last and all the time that the power he used was not within himself. He realized further that every living soul can use this same power. He said to the crowds who looked on in amazement, The things that I do shall ye do also. And I am convinced that he knew full well what he was talking about. He must have, otherwise his name would not be as universally known as it is today. 
deeper, I repeat, there is an attraction to that name to be sure, and in whatever moments of weakness I may at times have, and I should not be human if I didn't have them, it is to this great prophet of God that I turn. He needed no miraculous conception in order to manifest the power of the life spirit. You have no immaculate conception to your credit, have you? Well, it is spiritual law that you and I can duplicate every authentic work this humble Nazarene ever did, is it not? Nor were you conceived without a human father, were you? I think not. That he was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, I am perfectly willing to admit, for you and I and every other living soul were also conceived by that same great life spirit, but through perfectly natural means. The other supernatural story robs this man of his power and his greatness, for it attributes to him an unusual power he never did possess. It takes him away from us. It puts him on a pinnacle where he does not belong, and it is very wrong and very blind of the churches to do this. Someday soon, they won't do it at all. No, friend, this man of Galilee knew the very same God law I am trying so hard to teach you about. Where did he learn it, you ask? I do not know. There are many places where one may learn the spiritual truths of God. Probably this man fulfilled a maternal ideal and therefore was the culmination of lifetime's hope on the part of his mother and fulfilled them through her own wishes and desires. That is aside from the point, though. In my little Alfred I see myself. My traits are his traits. In little Florence the same thing applies. If you breed a Clydesdale to a Percheron, you get a mixture. It is a well-established fact that prenatal care and prenatal ideas certainly have their part in shaping the fetus and the born baby. The great thing here, though, is that this man Jesus knew and recognized the power was at his disposal. He knew the power of God even though he were but a man. He lived in that power. He loved it. Did it ever occur to you that a great constituent part of the life of this Nazarene was loneliness? He was ever to be found either on some lone mountainside or perchance beside the sea. His was a lonely life. And I can tell you why it was lonely life. It was a lonely life because he recognized the fact that the great truths of God are always revealed in the quietness or the loneliness of the human soul. That is why. Why do you think I have been giving you these exercises in relaxation, concentration, restful, trust, etc.? Did you think for a moment that I did not have a very definite plan behind all these simple appearing little exercises? Perhaps you thought I was but trying to have you relax the body in order that the relaxation would do you good. It may be that you wondered why I prescribed these exercises, and it may be that perhaps they seemed somewhat useless and perhaps a little foolish to you. Well, let me say to you that nothing is farther from the truth than that. I gave you these exercises to prepare you to get into living, vital contact with the actual, literal power of the mighty, creative intelligence of the universe. Well, but you say to me, Dr. Robinson, do you mean to tell me that you are going to show me how to literally get in touch with the realm of God? And my reply is that I mean just that. I'm going to show you how to make the actual literal connection with God that you have wanted to make all your life. And when this connection is made, I assure you, your future is in your own hands. And I can then very safely hand you back to yourself to live and learn under the guidance of the master hand the mighty life spirit, and most of your lessons under this teacher will be learned not by begging from him for this or for that, but by keeping so still that you can hear what he has to say to you. For the spiritual realm always responds to the soul that is in tune with this wonder-working realm. The life spirit always responds to that life. It is the God law that such be the case. And when this flash from the God realm comes to you, you will know it and will never forget it. You will remember here that your thoughts are things. You will remember further that God works in the quietness. It is the still, quiet, small voice that brings the victory and sense of the overwhelming presence of the living God to you. Now in these relaxing exercises, I've had you fix your mind continually on that light area. 
I've had you concentrate on the thing you want. I've told you to definitely set your mind on the one thing above all others that you really need in life. I have furthermore had you repeat the affirmation, I thank thee, Father, that thou hast heard me. Now, from now on, I am going to ask you to do something else. It is definitely established in your mind what you want. You are, night by night, throwing your thoughts, things of the Spirit, into the great cosmic consciousness which is God. You've been doing these exercises now for several months and are now where I consider you should be. You are now at the place where you should be able to make the definite spiritual contact with the power of the mighty life spirit and make it to your everlasting joy. Now let me warn you in advance that I cannot tell you just exactly when you will experience the sensation of the presence of God. I do not know you personally. I know nothing about your temperament, nor do I know anything about your daily mode of life. But I don't need to. The law of God works for all. The difference in the time taken for the actual manifestation differs in accordance with the speed with which you can rest in perfect harmony with the life spirit. For what I'm going to show you now is how to actually get into harmony with God. When you do that, you will know that the trolley of your life has touched the electric wire of God fullness. And you will then go wherever you want to as long as that connection is still there. In putting yourself in harmony with this great cosmic consciousness, it is necessary that you choose some part of the day or evening for this one exercise. Forget the other exercises for the time being and set aside some regular time of the day for your lessons in actually contacting God. Perhaps the morning will suit you best. Perhaps the afternoon is more convenient. Perhaps just before going to bed would fit your needs better. These things I do not know and you will have to pick out the time best suited to your circumstances and surroundings. The main thing is that you have a definite time set for your daily exercises in God's actual presence, for that is literally what you're doing. You will get after a while so that you would not miss this half hour for worlds, for the strength coming to you from the cosmic life spirit will stagger you. I want you in your time for finding God to lie down, be absolutely at rest, just as you have been doing, only more so if possible, not a move very quiet and slow breathing. You lie like a log of wood or piece of lead. Not one single move. Keep absolutely still. Not a strained stillness at all, but an absolute and utter relaxation of every nerve and every muscle. The best illustration I can give you, although not at all appropriate, is that of a drunken man. He is in a state of utter relaxation not the stiffness of a corpse at all, but just simply the leaving go of every attempt to do anything at all except breathe to the full, slowly fill the lungs, slowly exhale, and do it noiselessly too. Then, forget everything in you, cast it out and listen. Did you hear what I said? Listen. Don't move at all, just listen. Forget who you are if you can. Forget everything, just lose yourself in the great cosmic consciousness of the universe. Keep widely awake, intently listening. Do not go to sleep if you can keep awake. If you cannot keep awake, then do the exercise sitting in a chair. Wide awake, remember, intensely alert, listening, listening, listening. An absolute quiet should be there. Not a move made no one to disturb you, then listen, at some time or other, and before you have been doing this, waiting on God exercise very long, there will come a moment in your life while you're doing this exercise, probably when it will seem that the whole realm of heaven has been opened up to you. You may want to sing if you do, why sing? You may want to shout if you do, why shout? No matter what form of manifestation this flash from the spiritual realm takes, it will sometime or other come to you, and it will fill you with a spiritual peace that you never knew before. It will transform you. It will make you extremely happy. Now I must also warn you a little here also. 
under no circumstances try to prolong this moment, but just let it take its natural course. Be sure that you do not try to force its return, for you will not be able to do that. If it does return to you, it will be without your help, and it will be in a moment when you least expect it. Some day or other, there will come surging into your consciousness waves upon waves of joy. Tears will flow, perhaps, but you will know that you are in harmony with the God of this universe. You will have had a flash from the skies, one might say, and you will be supremely happy, I assure you. I cannot say to you definitely just when this experience will come, nor can I tell you where it will come. It may come after you've been doing this exercise for only a few days. It may not come to you for months or years, but sooner or later it will come. It is a law of the spiritual realm that it must come. Your natural environment and your natural life should be in harmony with the cosmic principles of the universe, or in other words, with God. Intenseness of desire will be a great help for it is the desire for this harmony with the cosmic consciousness that brings it into being. Once this flash is recognized, you need never fear further about your relationship with the master intelligence behind the universe. Of course, it is possible even after that for you to do things which might break the connection, but the law is that after this consciousness is established, you will never do many things you're not supposed to do. You will not commit very many of what the Christians like to call sins. In passing, let me call your attention to the fact that a good many things which the church would have you believe are sins are nothing of the kind. To the contrary, many of the things they look upon as being opposed to God are, as a matter of fact, nothing more or less than a normal material manifestation of the spiritual law working through you. The principle behind this manifestation from the spiritual realm is this. There has come to you a little bit of the joy and happiness which is contained to the full in the realm of God. The God law has been brought to play in your life momentarily. Now the question may arise, why cannot this supreme happiness be made permanent? And let me say to you in answer to that question, that if it were made permanent, while you are manifesting as a physical being, you would be utterly no use to yourself or to anyone else. Some of the most spiritual people I know are some of the loneliest people and their connection with the spiritual law invariably results in a breakdown in which the tears flow copiously. This spiritual realm manifests to different individuals in a different way. Most of them, however, are made quite happy, while others are reduced to tears. Still others can go out and command sickness to leave inflicted bodies in presumed violation of all natural laws. As I stated, I do not know whether this experience will come to you, but you must keep up this exercise earnestly, intelligently, until it does. Let there be absolutely nothing fanatical about this, for I assure you, you are dealing with a psychological and spiritual law, which is as sure as the law of gravitation. It would be a sorry scheme of things if it were not possible for a human being to get into vital living contact with its own creator. You will remember that the Bible allegory tells us that after God had spit in the ground and made man out of a hunk of mud or clay, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The story, of course, is absolute fiction and an old myth, but at the same time there lies under that story a very deep and very spiritual truth. Leaving out of the question entirely the method by which man was made, we know that he was made physically at some time or other, we also know that the great master intelligence of the universe was directly responsible for that making, so we shall accept that fact and let it go for the time being. The point I want you to understand here is that this same life principle I am teaching you about at some time or other breathed into this material thing called man the breath of life. In other words, he permeated his creation with himself and he is life. Therefore, every living thing is a living, actual manifestation of the first creative life principle of the universe. There can be no such thing as a man living without the God principle causing him to live. Whatever it was that happened so long ago which caused man to lose sight of the life principle, I shall not go into here, for it is beside the point. The thing I want to do here is to restore that communion between God and my students. I have stated many times, and I repeat it here, 
that there is a vast harmony running through the entire created scheme of things as they exist today. Certain it is that if you are out of harmony with the great intelligence, by no possible means can you fulfill your place in the universe. Furthermore, if you're out of tune with this God law, you cannot obtain from it anything you might need for the simple reason that the channel between you and the rest of the universe is not open. When the weather gets very cold in my home and the temperature drops, all the violin pipes on my organ go flat and have to be retuned to fit the cold weather. If on playing the organ in cold weather I used the violin pipes disharmony results so I never play the violin pipes in the wintertime. When it warms up, of course, they naturally go back into tune again. But when those pipes are out of harmony with the rest of the organ, they are useless to me and consequently I never use them. Neither will the great life spirit use you in the eternal scheme of things as long as you are out of harmony with it. Now to get back into harmony with it, I have given you, covering a period of months, certain fundamental truths and certain dynamic spiritual exercises to do. In this way, I have directed you back again into the great spiritual realm of life, and I am only asking you to desire earnestly enough and keep quiet enough for the original connection that has been broken to be reestablished between you and the creative life spirit which gave you life in the first place. That is all I am trying to do, but it is enough. Many points may arise at this stage of your journey, but don't write me letters about them unless you feel that you really must. I am flooded with mail now, and I know the questions that you're going to ask me, and the balance of this course will be given over to dealing with those questions that have come into your mind since you studied this lesson number 14. From time to time, as you keep in harmony with the cosmic law, this experience will probably be repeated. And here, let me warn you very carefully against the great mistake that most people make. They think that if the consciousness of this cosmic presence is not there at all times, that they are out of tune with the infinite. No such thing. The proof of the spiritual law lies in the efficacy to control a human life even though that life be not conscious of it. You would not want to be supremely happy every moment. I mean the happiness which manifests itself in either singing or shouting or crying. For there is something in life which is far greater than that sort of happiness. There is what we choose to call peace, and that is a quietness of life which I cannot explain to you. I experience it to be sure, but as far as putting it to print or defining the cosmic peace, I cannot do it. You, however, will experience it after you have received that manifestation from the spiritual realm. At this point, I am going to leave you until the next lesson. And do this exercise very faithfully, remembering that your whole future is now dependent upon your making this connection with the spiritual realm. Don't be in too big a hurry about it, for the chances are that it will come when you are not looking for it. Points to remember in Lesson 14. 1. The spirit of the God law is contacted and comes into consciousness in the quietness of the human life. 2. Intense desire is very effective in bringing the manifestation from the cosmic realm into your own life. 3. If, when the manifestation of cosmic power is made, you feel like singing or shouting or jumping, do so. 4. Do not try to force these moments to come into your life at will, for you will never be able to do it. 5. It is a law of the spiritual realm that you cannot desire anything from this realm without your desire being granted. So if you do not make this contact immediately, it is because you are not keeping quiet enough. But do not worry, for you will make it. 6. Don't forget in this period of relaxation not to use any affirmation of any kind. Just listen. And out of that stillness will come to you the flash of the consciousness of God. Examination questions for lesson number 14. These examination questions are for your benefit and you should know the answers to them all. If they are not clear to you, read your lesson again and again until they are clear. 1. The power used by Jesus is available here and now, but it is not the power of the subconscious mind. What is it? 2. What is the real spiritual part of you? 3. What comments are made in this lesson upon the biblical injunction, lay not 
up for yourselves treasures on earth? Four, did the life after death theory originate with Jesus? Five, there is one secret that until it is learned, the God realm will not have been plumbed to the full. Six, why did Jesus pray to his father before raising Lazarus? Seven, in what sense was Jesus conceived by the Holy Spirit of God? Eight, why was the life of Jesus a lonely life? Nine, what were the exercises given in preceding lessons intended to prepare you for? 10. How do you prepare yourself for the exercise in actually contacting God? 11. Describe that exercise in detail and its objective. 12. Most of the lessons to be learned from this mighty life spirit will not be obtained by begging or prayer. How then? And that concludes lesson 14 of the Psycheana series. The reason I like this so much is because I'm very impatient. I'm somebody that wants the answers now. I'm somebody that goes to the last chapter of the book when I read it. I'm somebody that goes to the last paragraph of the chapter. I want to know the answers now. I skip ahead all the time. And so these lessons have forced me to slow down and make contact with the living God in a unique and particular way over time. It's hard to force me to do that, but it has. I've gone through the affirmations. I've done the exercises. It's a simple exercise. Remember, all powerful spiritual truths and lessons are simple. If it seems complicated, there is something wrong with it or it's being made complicated for no reason. This is pretty simple. You've gone about this process of contacting and finding and awakening the living God, becoming aware of its presence. And the importance of stillness is such an important thing. In my 90-day meditation program, I recommend at least one day. But if you can do every day, that's even better. And in the Master Key program and other programs, really the most important thing that you can do at the very beginning is to become still. Stillness is such a hard thing. All of these old New Thought teachers talk about the silence. But the silence really can't be found in the way they're talking about if you're not still. And for me, I have the monkey mind, I have the monkey body. I'm adjusting, I'm moving, I'm uncomfortable, I am sensing everything. So forcing myself into stillness is difficult. Sometimes it's easier for me to do it sitting in the sun or laying down. I have tried both. But if I start to work on this on a regular basis, I can, I can do it for 30 seconds and do it for a minute. If you can find that stillness for 30 minutes, it's pretty amazing. Now that means complete silence, no meditation being listened to, which is hard. My mind scatters and runs all over the place. And so he's not saying to not have any thoughts. He's just saying at this particular point to remain completely still. Is that something that you can do? I'm not surprised if you can't. Most people can't. It's something that you have to work on a little bit, but if you can find that way to be in stillness, you'll start to have contact with this higher God power. And there is no doubt about it. I just love what he says here that you're going to be given access to the full realm of heaven when it will seem that the whole realm of heaven has been opened up to you. That's what we're trying to do is open up the whole realm of heaven for you. And this is one of those courses that can help you do that. In addition to a lot of the other teachings that we've gone over so far. So I'd love to get your impressions of lesson 14, how it's been going. Have you been doing the exercises? Have you noticed any changes in your understandings of God or understandings spiritually about this God law? please put it in the comments. Put a like on this video so that more and more people can get access to this course. We have 14 lessons, six to go. Hopefully we can um, get this done and, and we can further our expansion of understanding through this course. So let me know how it's going. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.